Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cloud Pro Provider AWS Update and Roadmap at KubeCon Europe 2021. We'll start off going through the agenda that we have for today. Uh, so first I'll be talking through um, the background of the cloud provider extraction migration um, and the status of the cloud controller manager. Then Nicole will be talking about the cloud provider V2 effort. Uh, after that, Aberk will touch on the credential provider. And finally, Yang Yang will uh, give us a little bit of information about the AWS load balancer controller and the roadmap there. So let's get started. Um, okay, so, um, so to touch on the background of the cloud provider extraction effort, this is something that's been going on for quite some time in the community. Uh, the original implementation in Kubernetes uh, had a Go interface um, called the Cloud Provider Interface that was built into uh, Kubernetes along with the, each Cloud Provider's implementation. So um, the initial versions of every Cloud Provider was actually compiled into all of, to each binary. But the community quickly realized that this was already causing and just going to continue to cause significant bloat as more Cloud Providers were added. Um, and the, the maintenance effort was just going to be too great. Um, so the, the effort was started to extract all of the cloud provider specific code. Um, so that's like each cloud provider's SDK and uh, any logic that is specific to a cloud provider would be broken out into separate repositories um, and compiled into separate binaries, uh, not using the the main build system. So this really, this began a multi-year effort um, to extract all the code um, and uh, that's still going on today. Um, so I just wanted to quickly go over uh, each of the components that had cloud provider code or have cloud provider code and the extraction effort related to those. Um, so first, uh, the, the Cube Controller Manager, there was some cloud provider related code in four of the controllers uh, that would become the Cloud Controller Manager. That includes the node, the node lifecycle, the service, and the route controllers. And we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail a little bit later. Um, and then there was also the, the, the volume uh, control loops. And those um, are being replaced by the CSI driver effort. So for AWS, that um, would be the EBS CSI driver or the uh, uh, FSX CSI driver. And uh, another component is Kubelet. Kubelet has a couple areas of cloud provider code, um, one of which is the Docker image credential provider. So this was some code that was built into Kubelet and for common container registries like ECR, um, there was a package there that would uh, provide the, the, the Docker image credentials when Kubelet was doing a pull image. And that is being replaced by a external binary that Kubelet will exec. Um, it's very similar logic. Uh, it's just outside of Kubelet Kubelet execs it during pull image and um, gets the credentials back. Uh, additionally, um, the other area of code in Kubelet was fetching node addresses, which is being replaced um, in the, the Cloud Controller Manager and the Node Controller. Um, a couple other areas that are worth mentioning is the API server had the capability to do SSH tunnels, um, but this was, uh, so this was related to cloud provider code because the API server had some um, flags that it took uh, that enabled SSH tunnels only on um, GCP. And so that effort is being replaced by the uh, network proxy effort 
And finally, uh, the Cube API server initially had a uh, persistent volume uh, mutating webhook um, and persistent volume labeling mutating webhook. And that is being replaced by, or that was already replaced by the persistent volume controller. Um, so all the cloud code was removed from that. Um, so I wanted to give a timeline from AWS's standpoint, but this is, these are estimates and they're, this is only, this is only going to be true if everything goes perfectly. So um, it's relatively unlikely to look exactly like this. Um, but this gives an idea of what, like the order that in, in which things have to happen um, and what the earliest possible dates for some of these would be. So um, you can see for the features, the first is the HA migration framework. This is something that is, uh, it was actually, it just was merged um, in 121 in alpha state. And um, this allows HA clusters to migrate from just running the Kube controller manager to running both the Kube controller manager and the cloud controller manager using a migration lock. Um, so the plan for this is to go beta in 122. Then we have the credential provider framework. Uh, this was alpha in 120. And uh, along with the AWS uh, ECR credential provider, that was alpha recently. Um, actually, I think it was kind of in between 120 and 121. Um, so ideally, both of those uh, along with the AWS Cloud Controller Manager would be beta in 122, um, which would allow all of them to go GA in 123. And what all this means is that the earliest, according to, you know, like AWS uh, Cloud Provider timeline, the earliest possible date for the entry code removal is 124, but that will probably be later just because of other dependencies. Um, so in terms of the AWS Cloud Controller Manager specifically, um, the upstream features are no longer being accepted. Uh, pull requests are limited to bug fixes. So if you are opening a feature pull request, you should open it on the cloud provider AWS repository where we've duplicated the V1 provider code there. Um, we currently have alpha builds for the cloud, uh, the cloud controller manager. Um, and we're working on beta right now. And um, if you do want to go check it out, um, there's some, uh, a couple of different ways you can install it on a cluster. Uh, if, you are, if you use COPS, you can um, configure it in the COPS config, the, the COPS cluster config um, to uh, use the external uh, uh, cloud provider. And there's also a Helm chart provided in the repository as well as just some uh, YAML files that you can use to install it. So what are the responsibilities of the AWS Cloud Controller Manager? Um, for us, it's the node, the node lifecycle, the route, and the service controllers. The node controller is responsible for updating node status and node addresses. The node lifecycle controller acts on node events. So you might have a node deletion uh, where you actually need to go and delete the node object um, that would fall under the node lifecycle controller. Uh, then the service controller simply manages uh, cloud load balancers for load balance service services. And currently it, it uh, handles ELBs and it has some NLB code but we're uh, talking about moving the NLB code to the um, AWS load balancer controller, which Yang Yang will talk about later. Um, and then the route uh, controller manages a uh, cloud route table. If you have nodes that are using um, one, if, if your nodes are set up with one CIDR, uh, one pod CIDR per node. Um, hey, I'm um, with that, I, I'm sorry, with that, I'll hand it off over to Nicole to talk about Cloud Provider uh, V2. Okay. So 
Um, hey, I'm Nicole from VMware. I will talk about some updates on the current AWS Cloud Provider v2 implementation. We will continue to support the existing AWS Cloud Provider in out-of-tray mode. Um, this new version will address many new issues and gaps in the current v1 provider implementation. Um, so for, for example, we are looking into allowing node names that are not the private DNS of the EC2 instance. For now, AWS Cloud Provider forces the node name to be the same as AWS private DNS name. Uh, for, for, for example, this leads to the node being removed if a different node name is used. So it should be allowed to use any name as the node name. More descriptive node names are generally uh, helpful and useful. Currently, load balancer can only be created with a machine generating name, giving load balancers um, easy to rate names will greatly enhance the user experience of Kubernetes on AWS. We also consider adding something to the service annotations and allow users to directly manage this. So a new V2 implementation will try to address these limitations. Also, we need this since the V1 legacy implementation is going to be removed soon. Our V2 implementation is in alpha state and after the launch, it will be supported for new clusters. So to develop cloud provider implementation, we need to implement a few common interfaces like instances, load balancer, and zones. So for example, the instances and zones interface methods will be called from the node and lifecycle controllers. The load balancer interface methods will be called from the service controller. For instances, we have an initial implementation of instances v2 interface. Um, instances v2 is an implementation for instances and should only be um, implemented by external cloud providers. Implementing instances v2 is behaviorally identical to instances, but is optimized to significantly reduce API calls to the cloud provider when registering and syncing nodes. Uh, for example, we have implemented in the interface methods like whether uh, to check whether the instance is, is exists or is shut down, uh, where we use the node name or provider name ID fields to find the node in the cloud provider. Um, as I mentioned before, we are looking into allowing node names that are not the private DNS of the EC2 instance. In the near future, we will support node naming policy other than private DNS names. Implementation of this interface will disable cores to zones interface. So zones will be uh, uh, is deprecated in favor of retrieving uh, zones or region information from instances v2. This interface will not be called if instances v2 is enabled. The existing zones interface was mainly uh, created for the Kubeless to interface with the local metadata server to fetch a node's zone and region. With external cloud providers, it makes more sense for the zone or region logic to be coupled to the instances interface. After Kubernetes version 1.20, zone and region information should be added in the instance metadata type we are using as part of the new instances v2 interface in the cloud provider. Um, so in most cases, the zone or region information is contained in the gate get instance API core of a cloud provider. This change will reduce the extra core for zone or region in the cloud provider. So for load balancer, we have an initial pass of the load balancer interface that is currently working in progress. There are some key issues all we need to address. So like first, right now load balancer can only be created with the machine generated name, making it very hard to distinguish in AWS if multiple load balancers have been created within an account. 
Um, also, the default load balancer name for the cloud provider from the cloud provider package, which is currently in use, have been deprecated and needs a replacement. Giving load balancers easy to read names will greatly enhance the user experience. It would be nice if we could pick a template to use for naming. For example, a combination of cluster name and service name might work well. And prefixing the load balancer name with some meaningful name like the environment, the app stack, et cetera, will be uh, very much helpful. Uh, and we also consider adding something to the service annotations and allow users to manage this. Um, another thing we are looking into is we should build more expressive APIs for load balancer configuration options. Right now it's an explosion of annotations that are really hard to comprehend. So I'll, pa I'll pass to our book to talk about credential provider. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, my name is Iberg, and I am a software engineer here at AWS working on EKS. And I'm going to talk about the credential provider extraction effort. It provides some context and then briefly explain what it actually means for the cluster operators. So far, we have been mostly talking about the responsibility of the control plane. But as Nick mentioned, Tuplet also includes some cloud-specific code. Uh, I'll be talking only one of those uh, specific cases where Tuplet runs cloud-specific code, and that is fetching image credentials uh, for non-public registries. Uh, whenever Kubelet needs an image from a non-public registry, it somehow has to fetch the credentials so it can actually get that image. And currently, Kubelet does this itself. And as you can imagine, each registry has different APIs, different expectations, and Kubelet has specific code for each different registry to fetch those credentials. And that is actually what not is actually not what we want at this point because we're extracting cloud-specific code. So somehow we have to get rid of this responsibility. And in order to remove this responsibility from the kubelet, uh, a new cap was proposed. And this cap basically pro proposes a new plugin-based approach where kubelet basically talks to these standard binary uh, plugins to fetch the credentials for itself. Um, so how it happens is basically these plugins are nothing but standalone binary running along with your kubelet on your nodes. And whenever kubelet needs credentials to fetch an image, it will basically communicate via start if the output and then ask this binary to fetch the credentials for itself. They use well-formed JSON, it's version and serialized, but again, everything is happening through start input output. I strongly suggest reading CAP if you like to learn more. It's very well written and it explains how this all connects. Uh, next slide, please. So, okay, Kubernetes is not going to fetch these credentials for us anymore, uh, but what does it mean for us? Do we have to do anything? Uh, and the answer is yes. It means cluster operators will have to configure Kubernetes so it knows what plugin to use for what image. Obviously, initially, Kubelet will have no idea about for what image it needs to call what kind of binary. So in order to achieve this, there are two new flags you have to pass to the Kubelet. So the first one here you see on the screen is basically the location of the binaries, and I mean plugins. And this is, where, this is a folder where your binaries are located, and this is where the Kubelet is going to be looking for these binaries. And the second one is a pretty important one. Uh, it is the config file you will pass to Kubelet. And this config file will tell Kubelet which binary to use for what kind of images. It is basically a list of regular expression uh, cloud provider name pairs. And provider name here is the name of the binary. And Kubelet basically, whenever there's a match with the regular expression, you'll use the given binary for fetching images. That being said, it has to be in a very specific format and you can read the cap to learn about this format. For specific AWS users, 
we already have the ECR plugin implemented and ready. Uh, you can see it in our, on our repository. Uh, we are not shipping it with the cloud provider yet, uh, but we are planning to ship it in the future. And we also have more detailed examples and instru introductions, instru instructions on the documentation. And we also have a, more importantly, we also have an example config you can just use. So basically your ECR uh, logic just keeps out of the box. And with that, I'm gonna give it to Yang to talk about the controller. You're muted, Yang Yang. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm Yang from Amazon EKS team. So today I will talk about AWS Node Balancer controller. Uh, it's a controller to help manage elastic node balancers for Kubernetes cluster which satisfies Kubernetes ingress resources by provisioning application of the balancers and satisfying Kubernetes services resources by provisioning network of the balancers. Formerly, it's known as AWS ALB ingress controller. We did a rewrite and rebrand it to be AWS node balancer controller in October last year. Mm -hmm. So I'll talk about what support the country. So currently with ingress resources and application of the balancer, we support instance mode and IP mode. For instance mode, the node will be registered targets, traffic will reach the node port for your service and pro proxy to your containers. And for IP modes, traffic will reach your containers directly where, but, but your CNI must be using Amazon's VPC CNI. And we also support a feature called ingress groups, which allows users to specify a set of ingresses to be supported by a single application node balancer, which can help customer to saving cost. For services resources with network node balancers, we currently only support IP mode which is targeting the container ports directly. And we provide a compatible API with the entry service NLB support. Along with these two features, we also support a new CLD called target group binding, which exposes applications with an existing target group, like ALB target group or NLB target group. So this allows users to bring their own node balancer and target groups and just let the Kubernetes manage the targets inside the tables. So customer can use external tools like cloud formation, CDK, or Terraform to manage their node balancer infrastructure. Um, so what's coming next? So we will release a new versions shortly. The new version will include support for NLB instance mode, which will be similar to what we have in the entry controller. After this feature is released, we recommend to use an AWS node balancer controllers to manage the NLB for your Kubernetes service, which is more flexible. And we will support new NLB features more up to date. And it also addresses some technical limitations in the existing cloud provider. And we will also support static, support users to specify static IPs for NLBs. And we will also add a support called node selectors for instance mode, which allow you to specify the set of nodes used as the backend for your service. So you can use a label selector to match the nodes. This feature will be supported for both ingress and service and our type group binding CRD. For ingress, we will add a new CRD called ingress class parameters. So it's for ingress class support added from Kubernetes 118, where you can specify a ingress class for your ingresses, which contains additional settings. And along with the ingress class, you can specify controller specific settings using ingress class parameters we introduced. 
So inside ingress cast parameters, administrator can set uh, additional restrictions on the, the ALB settings, such as whether the ALB should be public or not. And also things like ingress grouping or IP address types. Also for ingress, we will add support for the new path type added from Kubernetes 118. And we also offer a feature to simplify the SSO rejection configuration for ingresses, which customer can use in a single occasion to configure the ALB to reject all HTTP traffic to HTTPS. That's what the new features coming for AWS in the beta couple. And I hand over to Nick. Okay, so yeah, with that wraps up our presentation on uh, the cloud provider AWS. Um, so we have some links here. Um, you can see the cloud provider AWS repository, uh, AWS load balancer controller repository. Um, the first link is to the documentation for uh, the cloud controller manager. Um, and any questions that you have, we would be happy to answer um, either now or on, you can always find us on Kubernetes Slack. We have our Slack usernames um, linked down below. So thank you very much. Appreciate you attending the talk.